<laughs> so, um, we are now trying to understand something about <coughs> analytical philosophy and as uh, we all know analytical philosophy is not a school of philosophy but a way of doing philosophy and uh, so what we will try and uh, identify uh, are some features or characters of analytical philosophy and uh, so uh, generally uh, analytical philosophy, if you try and read about analytical philosophy, then certain uh, books are very important as we see that one is called The Elements of Analytical Philosophy, 1949. Then the other book is called Semantics and Necessary Truth, An Inquiry into the Foundations of Analytical Philosophy, uh, 1958. And it's interesting that these philosophers, uh, some of these philosophers, particularly like Arthur Papp, are saying that analytical philosophy is not something new. It is something which existed in uh, earlier times also and Plato is also doing um, philosophical analysis and Aristotle is also doing philosophical analysis. So Plato is asking this question, what do you mean by justice? And similarly, uh, Aristotle is trying to analyze what is meant by being. So, uh, there are a lot of people who say that actually uh, philosophical analysis has always existed and uh, when Berkeley is rejecting the idea of physical substance, he is also doing philosophical analysis because he is saying that actually what do you mean by an abstract idea, abstract I human beings do not have the capacity to form abstract ideas and substance or a physical substance which does not have any qualities is an abstract idea, so you can't have an idea for that. Now, these are the kinds of thinking which uh, are trying to show that philosophical analysis has always been practiced by philosophers from the earliest times. But there are other people who say that no, uh, we have to see the beginnings of philosophy uh, mainly uh, from Frege. And there are others who say that actually you see the be best beginnings coming from uh, Bentham, Prithomenian. Now, what are these chief characteristics of analytical philosophy? We can talk about that. Uh, we talk about that and we can also look at the different periods of uh, the movement in analytical philosophy. Now, as I was mentioning yesterday, we were saying that if you look at Michael Dummett and his reading of Gottlob Frege, then he's saying that there are three important features that philosophy is primarily the study of thought, one, two, thought is not psychological, three, that thought is best understood as we understand it through language. So the opposition in Gottlob Frege in uh, the second assumption is to psychologism that though we are talking about thought, we are not talking about somebody's thought, we are not talking about thought as a psychological entity. So there is a huge emphasis on logic, replacing epistemology as it were, uh, because as it was supposed to be central in case of Descartes. There is also a great deal of emphasis on language, especially when you look at Frege's work of 1884, which is called The Foundations of Arithmetic where he said that the way to investigate the what is the nature of number is to analyze a sentence in which the term number appears. So when you are trying to analyze a concept, you are actually, how do you analyze a concept? You analyze it in a, by analyzing a sentence in which that concept is being used. Then there is also one of the features which we find uh, characterizing analytical philosophy is that there is a certain tendency to reject metaphysics and this is an inheritance which is coming from Kant and David Hume through Russell and uh, you have from in <laughs> Russell also earlier Russell was a Platonist but by the time uh, he grows up he grows into the philosophy of logical atomism. There is also as I mentioned yesterday a great deal of emphasis on philosophy of language and uh, as I mentioned yesterday not everybody agrees to the fact that the analysts are only analyzing language. 
Ryle is saying that we are analyzing psychology. And uh, H.L.A. Hart is saying that we are analyzing law. And Austin, as I mentioned yesterday, is saying that what we are analyzing is speech acts. So, one of the things to go back in terms of history is that 17th and 18th century are generally spoken of as the age of enlightenment and 20th century is supposed to be marking what we call the linguistic turn. And this is also a book which was published in 1967, which was edited by Richard Rorty and the book's name was called The Linguistic Turn. Uh, many philosophers, it is supposed, particularly in England and America, took to linguistic methods and they thought that philosophical problems are problems which can be solved or dissolved or resolved either by reforming language and creating an artificial language or by being explained in ordinary language. Now, Wittgenstein, as you would know, was also talking about the bewitchment of language. And uh, when you use the term analysis, you will also have to see that where do you get the term analysis elsewhere? Psychological analysis, chemical analysis. So, what is common between philosophical analysis and chemical analysis? That in chemical analysis also, you divide the thing into its simpler components. So, in philosophical analysis, like you were saying that, okay, what do we do about knowledge? Knowledge is, what are the smaller parts? Justify, true, belief. So, you are analyzing it to into its simpler components. So, this is common between chemical analysis and philosophical analysis. What is common between psychological analysis and philosophical analysis? Psychological analysis, like in case of Freud, what is he saying? He is saying that once you get to the root of the problem, then the problem is solved. So, somebody is afraid of darkness, then you talk to that person and then you find out that something had happened in his childhood or her childhood where somebody was punished and locked into a dark room and it was repeatedly done so. Subsequently, the person forgot that whole story, but the fear of darkness remained. But once you help the child or the person to recall all those stories, then by recalling those stories and finding why that person is afraid, the very idea gets dissolved. So, like psychological analysis, also here in philosophical analysis, what we are saying is that, that through going to the roots of the problem, the problem will be solved. Now, uh, there is a very important work which first came by the title, as I was mentioning, that which are the important books. First time when you do, do you find the books with the title uh, analysis in them. So, one book is by Field and Sellers. It is called Readings in Philosophical Analysis. This is coming in 1949. Then there is another book in which philosophical analysis is mentioned, again by the same author, Logic and Language, 1951. And then, as I was mentioned, mentioning, Ammerman and Richard Rorty are talking about. So, how do we define analytical philosophy and who is to count as an analytical philosopher? This is the kind of a background that we are talking about. So, there are three groups sometimes which are referred to. One group of philosophers are called G. E. Moore, Russell and early Wittgenstein. This forms one group. In this group, you also have certain other very important philosophers like C. D. Broad, Frederick Ramsey, John Wisdom and Stebbing. So, these are, this is one group of philosophers who are supposed to be analytical philosophers. Another group of philosophers who also use the method of philosophy, uh, philosophical analysis are what called the members of the Vienna circle. Now, who are the members of the Vienna circle? There are scientists and mathematicians and many other people, but who are the principal people in that? As we were mentioning, one is Moritz Schlick, the other is Rudolf Carnap, then there is Otto Neurath, then there is uh, Frederick Weizmann and Herbert Field. So, when you talk about the Vienna circle, you are talking about Moritz Schlick, 
Carnap, Otto Neurath, Weizmann, Herbert Field. Then there is a, another group which is called the Berlin Society of Scientific Philosophers. And I think uh, the two big names in that are Karl Hempel and Reichenbach. So some people identify analytical philosophers into these three groups. Linguistic philosophers often use, uh, as I mentioned, the idea of psychoanalysis and the bewitchment of language which has to be sorted out. Uh, Gellinner and Muir think that linguistic philosophy is uh, sociologically and psychologically determined aberration. Linguistic philosophers claim their continuity with the great tradition and uh, Ayer clarified that Kant's critique of pure reason also attempts to transcend the limits of the possible sense experience. It is not deduced from psychological hypothesis regarding the functioning of the human mind, but the literal significance of language. Uh, also, some of the things which are important is that when you are looking at a philosopher like uh, A.J. Ayer and his very famous and important work, Language, Truth and Logic, he is saying that the propositions of philosophy are not factual but linguistic. And they are not describing physical or mental objects, but they are talking about definitions or formal consequences of definitions. So, in this particular view, philosophy is seen as a part of logic, as is held by Rudolf Carnap. There are many questions which are being raised here and one of the questions is that what is to count as logically correct? Are there meaningful statements which are verifiable? And many people say that actually the whole verification theory etc. etc. cannot be explained without circularity because you are saying these statements are meaningless because they are not verifiable. Why are, why are you accepting only these, this condition of verifiability? Some people say because you already wanted to reject metaphysics and religion. Uh, Carnap is seen by many people as a philosopher of artificial language and Rudolf Carnap, if you look at uh, Bergman, he uh, sees the whole project of uh, Rudolf Carnap as a project to develop an ideal language. And what, why do you need to construct an ideal language? What would be the nature of ideal language? There are three things which are identified by Bergman. Every non-philosophical descriptive proposition can be transcribed into it, number one. Number two, no unconstructed philosophical statement can be put in that form and all philosophical propositions can be constructed statements about syntax or its interpretation. Now this is a more technical kind of a thing about which we can discuss a little later and understand it. But uh, as we say that people say that there are no philosophical revolutions, uh, we only keep on repairing our armor, uh, there is no philosophical progress. In all of that, this linguistic turn seems to be a major revolution. And the revolution called linguistic philosophy is to be viewed that philosophical problems are not to be solved at all, they are just to be dissolved, either by reforming language or by understanding better the nature of language we use. So the metaphilosophical discussion, however, has few representations. Instead, we have sometimes a very substantive kind of a discussion. So when you look at analytical philosophy, not many people are talking about what is analysis. And even in Russell, you do not find very clear definitions because there are many kinds of analysis that you can talk about. Same same level analysis, deep level analysis, etc., etc., and sometimes uh, these are very important accounts. 
So the moment you start looking at analytical philosophies, uh, instead of talking about analysis and language, uh, there are they headlong get into philosophical problems and their investigation. So one of the big things which was discussed in analytical philosophy is about the nature of synthetic a priori propositions. So are synthetic a priori propositions possible? Now you know that when I am using so far, there are many things which I am using rather loosely. I am using the term sentence, I am using the, sen the term proposition, I am using the term statement, I am using the term judgment. But we all know that all these things do not mean the same. Sentence is a unit of language. Proposition is generally supposed to be the meaning of the sentence. A statement according to Strawson is something which is made on a particular occasion to convey an information to the other. And a judgment is the kind of thing in terms of which Kant was talking. That a judgment is something which you, when you are using the faculty of judgment which is understanding is something that you make by using the categories of understanding. Now Kant had for the first time used the language of synthetic a priori judgments and he was saying that judgments, synthetic a priori judgments are actually the best example of knowledge and truth. But the analytical philosophers largely say that there are no synthetic a priori. So either a statement is synthetic and if it is synthetic then it is a posteriori or it is analytic then it is a priori. There is nothing like synthetic a priori judgments. The linguistic form of some sentences are misrepresented and the logical form of the facts that they signify are to be undiscovered. All meaningful statements must be empirically either confirmable or disconfirmable. That you know that there is uh, the verifiable theory, the verifiability theory of meaningfulness of statements, and then you have Karl Popper who is saying about the counter of it, falsifiability. That any sentence must actually, on principle, be falsifiable because there are many many statements which can uh, their verification does not seem to be giving us very much. Uh, Ordinary language is supposed to be correct by many things and then there is other linguistic philosophers and others opposing this theory which you find. Then there are linguistic philosophers that there are no problems at all. Then there are opponents of the linguistic philosophy saying that these problems exist but you are just evading them. Now Wittgenstein said that philosophy is primarily an activity to clarify language. So the principal task is to clarify language, not the source of truth like science. And there is a very interesting uh, small essay uh, in which one important philosopher says that science gives you truth, philosophy gives you understanding. Many of these people were saying that a large part of the philosophical metaphysical questions are actually only pseudo questions. Carnap, Schlick, Herbert Field, Weizmann, Godel, you know Godel's theorem, uh, Otto Neurath, Hahn, P.K. Frank were all members of the Vienna circle. And these were importantly talking about these things. Uh, as I also mentioned a little earlier, in the Berlin circle, there were people like Rachenbach, Hempel, Grelling, Von Mises and air from the, the air from England emphasized the verification theory. Uh, you also know that these people were very important people and they were so important that people wanted to kill them and Schlick was actually shot dead. So philosophy also had had and philosophical schools also have their martyrs. So Socrates is the first big martyr and against whom that is why Plato says that you know democracy uh, creates this kind of a thing and we have sinned against philosophy and though. So he challenges uh, democratic thinking etc etc. Of course we know that verification theory which uh, is part of some people who use the analytical method is not accepted by everyone and even air uh, modifies it towards the end of his life. 
uh, Gustav Bergman tried to create an artificial language, so did Carnap. And Quine, uh, again a very, very big figure in Western philosophy, also displays influence of positivism. So, linguistic analysis is used by many philosophers, not all of them are positivists and uh, especially when you move to Oxford, there is no school and this is best represented by Wittgenstein who was his own best critic in his later writing. Tractatus uh, speaks about language and picture theory of language which you will study. And later Wittgenstein in Philosophical Investigation, uh, he rejects this theory. Uh, Moore is interested in analyzing ordinary language. Ryle shows that how mental terms need to be analyzed. So for example, when you say that Hatim is answering his question intelligently. Now, Moore, uh, Ryle would say that there are not two activities which are happening that Hatim is answering a question and another act, uh, activity, he is answering them intelligently. It is a certain kind of answering a question which we are calling intelligent answering. So there are not, not two activities, but the same activity being described in two different languages. And therefore, Ryle gives his theory of what we call analytical behaviorism. So the mental phenomena is not a separate phenomena, but a physical phenomena itself of a particular kind. Uh, now, this was his famous book which was called uh, The Concept of the Mind where he was rejecting Descartes, Descartes theory which he called the theory of the ghost in the machine. So, he is giving you a concept of the mind using linguistic analysis. So, I am giving you an example of how linguistic analysis is used to solve a philosophical problem. And what was the philosophical problem? That in Descartes, you had two things, physical and mental. But the question was, how does the mental affect the physical? So, Descartes gives a very peculiar thing, that, oh, there is a pineal gland behind your back. Now, is the question is pineal gland behind the back is such a stupid theory. Now, is pineal gland physical or mental? If it is physical, the problem still remains, how does the physical thing get impacted by the mental? And if it is mental, then you have the same problem. And if it is a third kind, then you have not two, but three problems to solve. Now, Ryle, through analysis of language and sentences which use mental terms like intelligence, is giving you an answer. Uh, large part of people thought that Philosophical analysis actually rejects metaphysics. But by the time you come to 1949 or 1950, at that time, Strawson again comes back with metaphysics. And you have it in your course. The book is called Individuals. And the subtitle is An Essay in Descriptive Metaphysics. So Strawson makes a dis distinction between prescriptive metaphysics and descriptive metaphysics and he says that we need to look at metaphysics and say that prescriptive metaphysics, speculative metaphysics is wrong, but descriptive metaphysics which shows the interconnections between the terms that we use is all right. Similarly, Austin tries to give us a account of how language functions. And when you look at somebody like John Searle, he identifies analytical philosophy with concerns of analysis of meaning and takes the history as, again, he takes it back to Frege, Russell, Moore, as a natural kind of a descent coming from British empiricism. So, a lot of people think that the school of analysis actually comes from the British empiricists. And who were the British empiricists? John Locke, David Hume and Bishop George Berkeley. So, they all do not come from England, but they come from Great Britain because David Hume is a Scotsman. He is a Scottish philosopher. And we should also remember that even John Locke was not writing in English 
but in writing in Latin. So this is the Great Britain. So uh, Kant again is a very important figure because that is where you find methods of analysis are being used. Some people are saying as I repeat that the methods of analysis are invented by Frege who invented modern logic and made philosophy of language central feature. Uh, a very important period in philosophy of philosophical analysis is a period between 1939 and 1945. This is also the period of the war and this is also the period of logical positivism. Uh, two distinctions are very importantly discussed here. One is the distinction between analytic and synthetic uh, statements or judgments and the other is a very important discussion which is going on in that period between fact and value, utterances which are factual and utterances which are normative or evaluative. Now, the analytic synthetic distinction at that time was not just a distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments. There were many things which were being taken together because people were saying that analytic is coextensive with necessary, which is also coextensive with a priori. So, if a statement is analytic, it is also necessary and it is also a priori and it is also tautological. As a counterpart, there will be synthetic which is coextensive with a posteriori, empirical and contingent. And then it was said that statements in order to be meaningful can be only of two kinds. Either they are analytic or synthetic and if they are analytic, they are necessary, a priori, non-factual. If they are synthetic, then they are contingent, a posteriori and factual <coughs> and then they have to be verified. Uh, the distinction between the utterances which express true and false propositions and those which did not was supposed to be of great importance and the evaluative utterances were seen as only giving vent to our emotions. So, you know the emotive theory of Stevenson where moral statements are only expressions of our emotions and our approval. Now, philosophy, what is the task of philosophy? The task of philosophy is to get us to the truth. So, if the, the task is to get us to the truth, it aims, it cannot make evaluative utterances. First order evaluation are not meaningful. Philosophers may analyze the evaluative terms. So, metaethics is all right. So, you can analyze the term good, virtue, right, etc. But you cannot make evaluative statements because they are meaningless. So, philosophy's primary task then becomes to analyze concepts. They are foundationalist and this is a reductionism which you find. So, reductionism, phenomenalism, behaviorism, conventionalism were all associated together with what we call positivism and logical positivism in particular. As we were mentioning again and again yesterday also and today also, there is one camp which is called the perfect language or ideal language aspirants and then there are the ordinary language philosophers. Ayer's very famous book comes somewhere in January 1936 and this was an extremely explosive book written by a young man of 21 to 24, I think that is the young age where he is writing. The book is called Language, Truth and Logic. Young people are very excited and the old people are very disappointed <laughs> what kind of a book is that. Uh, there is also a cultural political zest 
in the writing of analytical philosophies <coughs> because many people say that no these people are not uh, interested in politics and ethics and they are doing only hair splitting just analyzing words uh, they are using analytical methods and they are saying that either a statement is formal in, as in logic or mathematics or it is testable or else it is uh, nonsensical. So all theology, transcendental talk about God, all these things are rejected. These philosophers are certainly in politics against the what we call German philosophical romanticism of the early 19th century and uh, they are of course uh, very much against what we discussed last week people like Hegel but they are not against Marx and Vienna circle in the early 1920s according to Ayer the uh, four important men were there Moritz Schlick who was a student of or a pupil of Frege, uh, Rudolf Carnap and Murat and the Marxist posit uh, pos uh, positivist like and the mathematician like Godel. According to Ayer, we have to in our quest go back to Ernst Mach. In science, we must finally deal only with sensations and their descriptions. And Vienna Circle was carefully following that, and it was much in the spirit of, as I mentioned, the Scotsman uh, David Hume in the 18th century. So they trace it back to the 18th century, and Ayer comes to Oxford in 1929 and he gets a degree in. 1933 and in 1936, he, uh, he was studying at the Christchurch College. My teacher, Professor Rupika Varma, also went to Christchurch College. Ryle again asked him to go to Vienna instead of Cambridge, where Wittgenstein was teaching. And he went to Vienna and was admitted uh, there. Quine was again a non German member of this group. And in 1932 to spring 1933, he stayed there and they discussed problems of observation statements which could be about sense impressions and uh, these are the kind of things which are happening over there. <clears throat> uh, we all I think so far have seen that some people are saying that philosophical analysis is the method of philosophy so all philosophers are doing this and some philosophers are saying that this is actually a movement which gets its thrust only at the turn of the last century in Cambridge as a revolt primarily against the absolute idealism and theory of internal relations. So again, Bradley, McTaggart and the others. And uh, as I said that it is in the first phase, it is marked by logical atomism in Russell and Wittgenstein in practice logical philosophicals. And then you have further developments as you find in the writings of Cambridge Analysis, right? We'll talk more about the nature and characteristics of that. Uh, we can see certain uh, developments of that of the verification theory of meaningfulness and the others. So roughly what we have so far uh, seen is that uh, philosophical analysis is not a school in philosophy. Uh, it is seen uh, with certain chief characteristics. Its uh, emphasis is on, on the study of language about language too then there is a so there is a certain section which believes that for correction of language we need to create an ideal language and there are certain others who do not believe.